So I'm not going to introduce Israel again because I'm going to sound like a broken record. But we also have Toby, who is coming from Switzerland, a long flight. <laughs> and he's also a customer engineer in Google Cloud Switzerland. Uh, the session today is Too Big to Fail, a pattern for enriching a stream using state and timers, which I do think is kind of like a follow up to the session that Israel conducted before. So without any further ado, a quick round of applause and let's start. Thank you and thanks for the warm welcome. Um, yeah, thanks for the introduction so I don't have to introduce myself. Um, you might be asking yourself um, why this title. I also had an alternative title prepared Enrich me if you can, but I think that um, has been used in the previous summit, but I was not 100% sure. Um, but since we talked about enriching the past day, um, I thought this might ring a bell to um, what we are talking about. Which brings me to the problem. And since I'm a customer engineer at Google, I have seen a problem in the wild, and Israel has as well with our customers, that I new from my previous experience with Beam, because I'm not new to the summit, so I worked with Beam before. And uh, if you have seen me talking before, or if you're watching this on YouTube as a recording, you can actually look up the previous talk and you will remember this slide, where I was talking about, I think two years ago, how to join two different streams together. Um, so imagine you have an unlimited and potentially very large stream of events, and you want to join the information from two different streams. Um, since it's unlimited and large, there are some constraints you have to then um, uh, face. The question is always how large it is. Um, so the, for the example here and also for the talk and also for the code demo, we have um, a very simple example. So the main one here, the main core stream contains uh, the full information about every object with its hash ID. And that is because uh, let's assume you have machines or a manufacturing floor and these machines have um, secret IDs that, are, um, um, that have a hashed value, which they usually emit their log values with. And then there's another stream that actually can be used to uh, have the lookup data where there's a serial number um, with that ID so that uh, the uh, clear text counterpart can be used to um, join uh, the two together. So we have these two streams, they want to be joined. We see here how they actually align nicely. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to Israel to enlighten us how this can be done in Beam. Yeah, thanks. So enriching streaming data, it's, it's a typical problem, but cannot be done, in, it has to be done in a specific ways, okay? So I already mentioned in, in another talk that uh, using uh, non-merging windows, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's possible, but the, the moment you have a merging windows, that's, that's not possible, like uh, sessions um, uh, in, in Apache Beam. So, so let's, let's have a look at the, this problem, how to reach uh, streaming data, okay? So, so one, one potential uh, way of doing this is by using side inputs, okay? So um, this is possible if, the second string is uh, small enough, no? So if uh, we have a small group. So, uh, we have already seen in uh, this morning and, and yesterday that this is actually a pain to implement, but it's possible to be implemented, okay? So, so you, you, you can do this. Um, but with the limit of the memory available in the work, okay? So um, you have a slowly updating uh, side inputs uh, that refresh every once in a while, okay? For some definition of a slowly or e every once in a while. And if you don't need a constant update of this, so this may work, and if the data is small. So this is one of the patterns that you can implement. But this is not always the case, okay? So maybe the second string is large enough, okay? So this is kind of easy, despite the painful experience uh, implementing this, this is probably the easy way of, of solving this problem. Um, you may also try to use an external service. Uh, there was a question in the previous talk about this. Um, as long as these uh, transformations that you are doing calling an external service are idempotent, like for instance for enriching, they are because you are just doing read only uh, requests. So this, this will work, okay? So that, that's the theory. You are doing remote procedure calls to an external database, uh, batching, whatever. But what happens normally with this? you overwhelm the database, okay? So this is a very typical pattern um, uh, or a very typical situation. And this basically ends up 
affecting the performance of your pipeline because the performance of your pipeline is going to be dominated by the performance of these external calls okay and also the cost may may increase a lot because you will need to put a lot of resources here if you are doing the uh, if your pipeline is to be processing a lot of data and the, so the scalability here normally depending on the kind of database that you have to use here might be vertical okay which is not not not, not ideal okay so well, so thanks everyone for coming. This is it. No, there, there's a different way. Okay, there's another way. Okay, so that's there's another way, and this is what we are going to be talking about here today. So we're going to be seeing the state and timers. So what is a state and timers? Whenever you need to do a stateful transformation in Apache Bean, you may leverage state variables and timers. Um, in so here we have uh, some data coming to your pipeline different colors represent different keys and they are coming in a streaming one of the nice features of a state variables in apache bin is that a state is always maintained per key the division between different keys it's done for you so the state is always local to your key so here we have th three different state uh, uh, storage for the different three keys that we have in this data like a uh, yellow green and uh, red um a state it's internally handled by the runner and every runner will do it in in different ways apache flink is using rockdb data flow is using big table but these are all details that are transparent for you as a bean developer you don't have to worry about about this and then there's also timers because a state should be bounded in size you cannot uh, keep growing a state forever uh, and then at some point you should garbage collect your state okay and also timers are useful for implementing other patterns like the, the ones we're going to be using here and then when you are ready to emit the stateful transformation so also well you can do that uh, you can do that let's say immediately by reading the state you can do that based on timers and so on okay so so this is generic for state and timers um, if you want to know more again commercial plugin here so we have a workshop tomorrow about this uh, on how to implement a stateful transformations with Python uh, in Apache Bean. So now back to Toby about the details of the implementation of the, the example that we were using for, for this talk. I thought we're done, but okay, we, we, no, we do it. Well. First of all, I have to say that um, the, the best thing about a Beam in the community is uh, that we have people working on examples. So we also have someone here in the room that worked on some example that I was using. He's sitting over there and he's waving <laughs> his hand at Igor. Thank you so much. Uh, though if, you, if you're listening to this on YouTube and if you have a computer in front of you, check out the Dataflow cookbook. I also linked it in the back of the slides, but actually that helped me a lot to stick this together. But before we actually start coding, we need to talk about message queues. And I have uh, two here as an example. So there's Kafka and there's PubSub. Um, and the uh, thing with stream processing, for at least for me, is it's a bit like functional programming. In functional programming, you're always thinking about what is if the queue has only one element, and if it doesn't have one element, then recursively do this, for example. And with stream processing, you always have to think about, okay, what's happening when I start my stream? What ha happens when I stop my stream processing application? And what do I do for each element, a bit like? And what do I mean with that is like, how much information does my, my stream actually provide right now? So how, how back it does it go in days? So cloud message queues usually give you only a number of retention days or sometimes even hours, sometimes it's a bit more. And with Kafka, for example, you could have a potentially unlimited retention. But when you're dealing with a stream that has um, not unlimited retention, you basically need to make sure that this uh, information is available again in the stream. What I mean by that is basically you have a shell script, for example, that actually reads the history before your pipeline gets started. For example, from a cloud data warehouse like BigQuery, publishes this history uh, into PubSub, and then in the sh shell script, your data flow or beam job is started so that this information then can be read from the uh, topic again. Because otherwise, the information that was published one month ago or a year ago is gone. So um, this is really important because then we can actually say, okay, we have the assumption that everything is available in our stream. Um, so in our core, in our lookup stream, we can uh, then uh, read and we know everything will be available. The whole history of the lookups will be there. Um, but um, to make sure, and this is actually going back to what Israel was saying, 
that this actually works and this pattern actually works and that you don't need an external um, thing like Bigtable, for example, that I presented two years ago as a solution, you need to make sure that the state is fitting so that the ma the, that's not too much uh, that has to be fit in the workers. And here in this case, we know that it's 30 days, uh, every 30 days a machine basically reboots forcefully or because of an update and then the new uh, ID and a new hashed ID will be published so that we know that okay for we need to actually keep this uh, lookup around for like 30 days and after that we can be sure that there will be a new one so we can then uh, make sure that we clean up this state and we do garbage collection. And now let's look at the beam pipeline. So um, how does it actually solve? So this is, uh, first of all, um, I have to say that this is very beautiful, but I didn't do these <laughs> types of things. So this is these tiny Lego, Lego blocks. But basically, it doesn't really matter. And this is what we learned also during the summit again and again. You can start building your pipeline in a batch mode and then later on uh, uh, switch to streaming. And when I build a pipeline, especially in a streaming pipeline, um, what really is nice is that there is now in Python also a test stream available. So you can actually start building your pipeline with uh, these kind of uh, late data and early data with a test stream on your machine without having to first write a script to actually publish this data to PubSub. This really helps uh, for people that are new to Dataflow uh, and also it helps me, <laughs> who's not new to Dataflow, but still uh, or new people to, to Beam that are basically uh, want to just play around with it on the local machine. So what this means is basically, um, let's say you uh, want to develop this. Um, I am at the end of the slide have a link to a GitHub repository where you can actually check out the code for this example where I'm using a test stream and you can just basically run the test and you can jump in the code and you can um, make a breakpoint and then investigate what's actually happening. And you can also play around with the data um, and the timestamps to say, well, what happens if the lookup now is published 10 seconds later, for example. Yeah, so this is the biggest slide, I apologize, but it's, it's needed. So what do we need? So we have the stateful dual, uh, dual function that you saw in the previous slide. We will have a timer for 30 seconds because we assume that it can be that, uh, that you know, the timestamps are not aligned by 30 seconds. So we're not using windowing here, but we are basically using a timer to account for late data, to, to, so to speak. And we have a GC timer, a garbage collection timer of 30 days. Um, then we're going to stay, uh, Sorry, Th then we're going to store all the lookup state into one state and all the core state into another state. Why is that? Because uh, as I said, the core state could potentially uh, misalign timestamp wise with the lookup state, but the lookup state is the one that has to be, be kept around for 30 days and then it can be GC cleared. And when the timer has expired, I mean, this is also nice about this. Um, again, it's not for me. I have to say it's super nicely done because you can see that the elements have different shapes, so they're coming in, there's a different uh, states being read, and then they're coming circles out. So if you wanna, you know, if you wanna look at code, I also have this for you. So this is how it actually looks like in Python. Um, again, uh, it's, it's basically an adaption of this nice Dataflow cookbook, um, but a bit more elaborated and a bit more advanced because now we have two, as I said, two different states. We have two um, timers, the GC timer and the buffer timer at the top. And then basically we're using uh, the union type for the core type and the lookup type. Um, and if you want to check out the code on the next slide, again, there will be um, a link and a QR code to the GitHub repository. Um, and uh, overall, the, the code is actually pretty clean, I have to say. Um, and uh, yeah, I invite you to basically go and, and check it out and play around with it for yourself, um, but that's not everything yeah. we have for you today. Yes, I have, I'm here for the commercial plugins again. So, so if you want to know how this example was done from, from scratch and you want to do your own example, so um, uh, I would recommend you uh, going to these uh, uh, talks and um, this uh, workshop. Okay, so let me start first with the workshop. So this is gonna be an introduction from scratch to state and timers in Python. You, you need to know some Python. If you have familiarity with Apache Bean, that's better, but that's it, okay? It's gonna be hands-on workshop. So you need to come prepared with a development environment, your favorite one, and that will be a repo and all the details uh, will be shared uh, there in, in the workshop. And then 
when we are doing this kind of uh, pipelines, so um, like for instance, this enriching and like with these uh, timers and so on, so we want to be able to to operate these services um, uh, uh, in a reliable way. So this is going to be the discussion that uh, we are going to be t talking. Uh, like I think it's uh, in, in half an hour more or less uh, in this very same room. Uh, with uh, Bupinder uh, about how to operate the streaming pipelines as services uh, using BIM metrics uh, uh, to, to be able to, to, to have a reliability when we are operating uh, this kind of pipelines. And the example that we are using there is, is state and timers examples that will produce some output with some delay. Okay, and then we need to be able to provide guarantees uh, to our users about what to expect and when to expect it. So that, that's, that's going to be the topic of the talk. And the best thing is, if you're watching this on YouTube right now, you can just jump to these things uh, yes. after the talk, basically. That's why we also put it here with the title. So if you're watching this and you want to learn more, go there. Uh, before I come to the uh, link and I share some uh, fun facts about uh, test stream in Python, uh, because there was a discussion in previous days about Python versus Java implementation of Beam, uh, I wanted to say thank you to the organizers. Thank you for everybody that was involved with organizing the summit overall. Uh, it's an amazing event uh, each each year, and uh, it's a it's a you know it's such a great vibe to be here. So I feel really honored and Israel as well to to be um, you know part of this community. Now uh, out to the shoutouts. So um, as we all know, Kenneth wrote this nice blog post with stateful processing. Inigo who sits over there did the um, data flow cookbook. There are also two more uh, blog posts I wanted to share with cache reuse across UFNs and stateful processing uh, in Beam and data flow that you can find here on the slides. And uh, here you can find the code. And now, before I give you the room for questions, I want to share something regarding the Python's test stream. So the reason when you look at the code and you go to this page and you check out um, the code, why is there just one test stream and why are there not two test streams is because in um, in python they're not it's like a, a singleton object so basically what i did is i published everything into one stream even though there are two different elements there should be two different test streams that's possible in java because you have a create function in java so you can in instantiate it in python it's not possible so what i did here is i used a workaround where i basically published two different elements into one stream distinguish them, and then basically use them in my test pipeline. But I hope it will be useful uh, for you if you start uh, your journey with Beam and streaming and also with late data, because what it enables you is just you can plug in your own types and then play with the test stream and then see what's actually happening. And I also want to avoid that you have to go through the same hoops as I did, because first of all, I did a very clean implementation with two test streams, and then I found out, oh, no, it's not possible. <laughs> so um, I invite you. Um, to, to check this out.